right, so real quick, show of hands. Who has a great environment that you have to All right, great. So if you're not familiar with it, we're going to cover it in 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> maybe because I've got a lot of slides, and to run is really easy, so there should be no problem. All right. Uh, purpose. Uh, it is an orchestration platform. So basically what that means, we have containers or anything that you want, and it makes sure it counts. You know, if you want 10, it gives you 10. If you want 20, it gives you 20. We can do other things besides containers. That's its primary purpose that people use it for. Um, we're going to ignore the entire website there. Um, small unit of compute, pod. Containers live in pods. Multiple containers can live in a pod. And then pods are created by replica sets, which are created by deployments and data sets and cron jobs and so on and so forth. Uh, website and All right. So from a security perspective, we care about logging. Probably one of the more important things we care about in all of security, and Kubernetes as well. Um, there are lots and lots of different logs you can choose from, and you probably want them all because when things go wrong, so you're going to need them all to figure out exactly what So the probably the most critical here are Kubernetes API audit logs. They tell you exactly who, what, and where happened in the cluster. Um, you also need application logging, just like you need application logging for your entire environment. So Nginx logs, you're going to want those. Patch you all sort of random SQL logs, you're going to want all of those as well. They all exist here. Uh, a lot of times in Kubernetes, uh, you'll be something like Fluid D, which will just scrape all of those logs uh, into your log aggregation system. Uh, same thing with network logs. In Kubernetes, the networking is virtualized. So well, if you're up in the cloud, you've got virtualization on virtualization on virtualization, and it just keeps going. Uh, the same thing is with the networking. There is a it's called a container network interface, and all of the pods communicate on this virtual network inside of the cluster, and that's how traffic flows from one node to the next node to the next node. Um, and when I say node, if you're not familiar, just think VM. Uh, it's just an instance type to type into the cluster. Uh, and then DNS logs. Who doesn't love DNS logs? I think it's about enough said there. Uh, pain for you and application owners and everything else is usually pretty mild for all this logging. The, the nice thing is that you have a shared fate with the team that manages the cluster because they also greatly care about the logs because it's impactful to their operational uptime. So in a lot of ways, your journey and their journey is the same here. So it's usually pretty easy to get that turned on. Um, resource limits. So we're going to go a little bit slower here. Uh, this is a pod definition file. So pod, remember, is the smallest unit of Kubernetes and containers live within there. So if you see on um, line six, we start talking about containers. And on line 10, you say we're going to request, and I'm just going to start going down here, we want to request the memory, and we want to win the next 64 megs. Uh, same thing with CPU, we're going to request a certain amount, and then we're going to set our limits. Uh, this is important because without it, pods can request whatever they want, and your cluster will just make it happen as much as it can. Uh, if it's too big, it, the cluster just won't be able to facilitate it. But a lot of cases, there's a lot of big compute numbers that get tied to Kubernetes clusters, and they'll just happily make it happen for you. Um, we'll talk about how all this can be enforced, because right now, this pod that <laughs> you're seeing here is what an application owner will create. It's their manifest file, so they don't push it to the API server in Kubernetes, and then Kubernetes will do its best effort to create that resource for them. Um, again, this is very virtually painless because the Kubernetes administrators don't want their clusters falling over, so they probably already have something like this in place. Uh, Read-only file system. Uh, again, we're going to do on the top half of that uh, manifest, uh, and then on line 11 there, we have security context. And then below that, on line 12, we have the read-only file system. So what this means is when the container gets created, Nothing can be written on that entire disk for the container. The entire volume of that container can't touch it. So if someone breaks in to, let's say it's an Apache web server, and they get a hold in there, based off of some just a man injection, they can't drop a web shell in the root of the web worker because it's not going to be right. Uh, this can cause problems if applications need to write things like logs, disk, or something like that. That way they can be scooped up by fluentd to move into log aggregator. 
And that's where we get into the volume amount there. Uh, it's called an empty derf, is what it's called. So on my 18, you call it empty derf, and then you name that volume as engine X logs, and then up on line 13, 14, and 15, we're actually mapping that into the container. So what this does is it allocates space in memory on the node of the VM that this container is going to be running in and says you can write logs to this one location. So when someone lands on the box, that would be the only location that they could write to. Uh, it's not bulletproof, but it does make things a lot harder than someone not footballing on either. Um, this one's usually pretty painless. Um, you do have to work with the application owners again because they control these manifests and they are going to know their applications, so they're going to know what needs to be written where. Um, Service scan difference. Uh, in Kubernetes, every pod has a service scan. There's a default service scan that gives them access to the Kubernetes API, regardless of not if it actually is needed. Um, on line six, we set that to false. That way, that token's not there. It's kind of a least privileged point of view. If there's no reason for them to have a service scan token, regardless if they can do anything or not, then there's no reason for it to exist. Um, that one is usually pretty, pretty painless. It can be a bit touchy when you get into networking. So there's this concept called like a service mesh, which we're not going to touch on, but think of that virtualized network that I talk, talked about a second ago. There's another layer on top of it where like, the service mesh moves. Uh, and what ends up happening is there is a proxy container that you put in the pod. So you'll have an Nginx and a proxy container, and that proxy container requires a service account. So if you go through your environment and force everyone to disable it, your cluster is going to fall apart. So you have to kind of approach that one a little bit more carefully um, so it can cause some tips. All right, get it over. We're doing good. We've got a lot to go. All right. Uh, in Linux, there are things called capabilities. Every process has a set of capabilities. And then when you get into a container, the container runtime, whether it's Docker, container or whatever, assigns a set of process capabilities that it has rights to on the system. It's basically things that it can do. So it will be like sys time, setting time, it can do packet captures, so on and so forth. This security context here from 11 down to 14 drops all of those capabilities. Uh, a lot of times you can get away with this. Sometimes there's only one or two that an actual container needs. But in this case here, we're saying just drop them all in there. Um, if everything's self-contained, if it's just making like a database call or something like that, you can probably, you're probably just find something like this. But if you need to add capabilities, you can just add the added line there on 13, and you can just add in the very specific capabilities that you need. So in this case, uh, I have random ones like that add here in this time. Uh, so this time, they could change the time of the container if they wanted to for whatever reason. Uh, All right. Again, pretty famous. Uh, the question of enforcement, like I said, we're going to get to, because right now everything that you're seeing is still on the application owners to implement. And if they don't do it, there's nothing that's going to stop this stuff from this going. Um, non container uh, is basically just what it sounds like. A lot of containers run as a root user. And there's a couple of different places where you can combat that. One is at the image build process. It's very hard to do it there, uh, especially when you have people and developers that are pulling in information. And the container is straight off of the internet or from Docker Hub. Uh, but if you change it here and require this in the manifest where there's a security context that says run as root, run as user, run non root, you're effectively changing the user that's going to run that container when it actually runs in the cluster. The downside, if you're not careful, there's another one that I didn't include here, but it actually changes the file system permissions. Because a lot of times what you run into is a developer builds an application and builds up a container, runs it as a root, and then you implement something like this, and it fails because user one, two, three, four, group one, two, three, four doesn't have app limit, doesn't have permissions to run the binary or the Python web server or whatever it happens to be. So there's a there's another line that can go down in 13 and basically says change the file system permissions, that way you don't have this problem. Uh, this one's a bit more painful because of all of the little gotchas that can exist. Remove <coughs> this uh, So on line 12, we're still looking at the same exact plot here, but we've got a loud purple list. And what this little flag means is when a, we'll just pick on 
uh, this is not Nginx, but we'll just pick on Nginx. So when Nginx spins up, I want to say it's running as a www user, someone gets access to it and they want to escalate their permissions from the group in the container. This will prevent that from happening based solely on the fact that this flag prevents any process, any child process in the container from escalating and having more permissions than its parent process, essentially. Uh, and so that kind of shuts that down. Uh, and one thing I didn't talk about on this slide here where you're changing the user, um, when you think of container escapes, if you're a root user in a container and you do an escape, you are a root user on the underlying host. So this goes a long way to prevent that from happening because if you are if you land a one, two, three, four in a container, you have to either escalate inside the container the root and then escape it, or you have to escape and then escalate on the actual underlying host. Um, so this is just all about adding additional slopes. Uh, okay, perfect escalation is usually pretty painless. They just turn it on, no one really knows. Uh, network policies. Networking is wild in human hands. And they have these things called network policies. And there are things tied to service mesh and things like that. But basically, these network policies, think of them as fire uh, By default, everything in a cluster uh, is allowed to talk to each other. It's fully open. So just think of your soft switching internal network that doesn't have both based firewalling turned on. It's the same thing. Only this is all virtualized in Kubernetes land. By forcing network policies, you can say only certain pods can talk to certain pods. You can say based off of label, only certain pods with a certain label or from a certain team are allowed to communicate. And you can control ingress and egress. It's really powerful. Yeah. It's also really painful because you have to make a choice as an organization. Who writes those rules? Do you have your application <coughs> developer write them? Do they write firewall policies today? Is it a big stretch for them? And I think a lot of times this just becomes a giant partnership between security and the application owners. That way you can ensure that you've got the right policies in place. And because of that, it's pretty painful. Because some people are going to nail it. Other people are just going to be like, when well, you want a policy, quad zero. Everyone can talk to me. It works. And, you know, they're, they're not wrong. It does work. Uh, images from trusted repos. Um, so in line 8 here, we're pulling Alpine Mondru. Um, this is coming from public Docker Hub. You have no idea what's in that image. You have no idea if you push that image up. You can trust some of the bigger ones because usually they're pretty safe. But we all know how that goes for open source software. Um, so the better thing is to have your own image repository and just require images from those. You can limit, you can put a rule in place that says only from these four repositories or some of the billboards. Uh, and that gives you a lot of opportunity to do things like vulnerability management, scanning the image and so on the billboard. It's usually pretty mild. It's just kind of a closer thing. You try to work with all of your developers to say, hey, this is what's happening. And you have to have that trusted repository to begin with. Um, and now for admission control. This is where all of this kind of comes into place. I've hinted a couple of times about enforcement. Um, this is how you do it. Uh, in Kubernetes, there's a bunch of different enforcement ways you can do this. Uh, there's Verno and the Gatekeeper, there's various security vendors, there's other things, there's some native Kubernetes things. But basically what we've got here are policies. I'm going to hold that on off for just a second. There's policies that you can create that mandate and require all of those controls that we just talked about. And that's what you get into like policy like this here. Um, and so at the top, we've got a cluster policy. And as we through it, um, like on line 13 and 14, this particular policy is looking at all the pods. And then you get into 15, and then on the next section over there, down on line like 22, 23, this is where we're setting, you've got to have limits to default. We don't say what they are, they just have to be in place. Um, these policies, you can make them all kinds of different ways. You can make them uh, like this one here. Uh, I don't know, have it written in this one. But basically, you can mutate what the developers push in and add this for them if they're missing it. And you can set baselines and minimum expectations. Or you can just have a flat out rejected request. 
So when they go to create a pod and say, I'm going to push this into the cluster, it'll validate it against this rule and all the other rules we have, all the criteria you have. And if it fails, kick it back to them with a message that says, sorry, done wrong, try again. Uh, I prefer that approach because I don't like carrying people's mistakes forward forever. It's just easier if they fix them to begin with and then we just don't have that, don't have that issue. But it's an organizational choice. So the miles can vary either way. Uh, so on the pain scale, this is anywhere from two to 10 because it's your adventure. Uh, you get to pick the policies you want, how you want to implement them, how complicated you want them, what you want them to mutate, or not want them to mutate. Um, do you want them just to listen to only mode? Like it really just it's a rabbit hole. <laughs> but this is how you would force your security baselines for the workloads that are being made into a bus. Um, runtime protection. Uh, runtime protection. Uh, everyone has an EDR. Question becomes, how do you do EDR in Kubernetes? Uh, there's a couple of different ways. You can stick it on the nodes themselves. Uh, if you're doing like EKS, there's ways to get it on there. If you're doing Google Compute, there's ways. If you're running bare bones, stick it on the host. Uh, a lot of the major vendors are container aware. Not that their detection policies are more strict because it's in a container, but they at least surface the information information like what a container uh, executed, you know, who am I, and things like that. Um, another way you can deploy things via what's called a sidecar, uh, and basically you inject with one of those uh, web, web policies that we just talked about, those mission policies. You basically create one that says anytime a new pod is created, stick my security pod in, or stick my security container in that same pod. That can work as well. Um, downside to that, if there's any problem with your container spinning up, because you didn't pay your licensing, there's some kind of weird mismatch on the host, the entire pod will fail to start. And that means your application owners, they won't be able to launch their workload. So it kind of puts security in a weird position. And it's, in my opinion, it's a lot easier just to get on the overall host. And then you can protect the host and all of the workloads. Um, because of that, if you go if you go to the host level, it's really pretty straightforward. It's just kind of figuring what process it is to go there. Uh, vulnerability management. Um, you need it. It's, <laughs> it, it is what it is, right? And it's vulnerability management. Um, it's you need it at the Kubernetes layer. That way, you can understand what vulnerabilities exist in the current version of Kubernetes that you're running. Um, you also need to scan your images. Um, the best way to do that is scan them in the pipeline. So when your developers are building an image and they're using uh, a Docker manifest to stick their application into a container and build it, stick it in your repository and stick it in the cluster, if you scan it in a pipeline, it allows them to fix things before those <coughs> things in the cluster. You also have to monitor the cluster that way you know what images are running. Uh, and mainly that's because things can shift. Um, so if you have uh, an Nginx, I'm just picking on Nginx here, but if you have an Nginx web server and it's been running for six months, or and it's using the same image that's six months old, and a new vulnerability comes out for it, you need to be able to know where in your environment it's running, just like with any other one of the program. So you need visibility in the pipeline to help developers fast track remediation, but you also need it at the tail end. Um, that way you know what's running where. Um, and then it's going to be very painful, very easy, culture thing. Um, depending on how you integrate with the developer pipelines, it will just go. Otherwise, it could be painful. Um, I wish I had better news for you. But um, if you want all of those YAMLs that I showed, find them there um, for the most part. And that, uh, that's it. Nailed it. Wasn't sure I was going to get through all of it. <laughs> all right. Uh, are there any questions? I've got a couple minutes, actually. Uh, yeah. Not really a question or a comment. I, I like that you have uh, Kyberno out there. It's a lot of uh, default for like Gatekeeper or something. Yeah. Uh, I the Kyberno. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah and uh, Gatekeeper is a lot more complicated uh, as in the way we structure the rules and then basically you build a template and then you build. Um, a file that consumes the template, and that's how you get your full policy. Versus, if you know, you just build it all in the YAML, and it's just done. And it's a lot easier. Yeah. I, I also like that because like actually apply objects to. So mm -hmm. it's not a, a, a gatekeeper that we're just 
call something that just sits out there and yeah. 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 Fun. Uh, basically, so if you don't know what Kafka is, it's an open source PR designed to work in Kubernetes and container environments. Um, they have a bunch of example policies that you can, you can leverage. Uh, you do have to be careful in larger clusters because it will fall over and just not the clusters, but Kafka will. So you have to make sure that you implement the right rules that you care about. Um, otherwise, yeah, otherwise it can fall over. Yeah. So if you ever work with open layer, uh, no, I haven't. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of containers. You what? There's a lot of containers. Oh, cool. Cool. Well, yeah. One more over here. Like, yeah. since you brought up Falco, have you, like, looked into, like, Kube Armor at all? It's a newer <clears throat> project that came out in July or June July last mm -hmm. year. It's yeah, like, it gained a lot of traction. I've looked at it. I haven't implemented it at all. Um, so, okay. It's... it's Something I usually like to put down when I work with like AKS customers, uh, I recommend what I want to teach like Hiberno with cool or mm -hmm. uh, yeah, vendor stuff. So, yeah, that's all. Yeah, uh, one thing we really touched on, but the secret management for bootstrapping containers, you know, yeah, the painfulness of that, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. horribly painful. Um, vaults. It is pretty much the de facto with some kind of like a mini container. So it's painful. There's not really a good way for it. Um, unless you just stole a plain secret. But don't be fooled. Secrets in Kubernetes are just basically foreign coded. It's a horrible name. They're not really secrets. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's painful. Anything else? Yeah, um, I have a question about the level specifically. Yeah, uh, I saw that a uh, Kubernetes can handle like logging. Uh, it has some policies, and then you define a message that it will like it will print out whenever there's an error. Uh -huh. Do you somehow use something else to structure it? Are you talking like the when the when the Kubernetes cluster fails, uh -huh. do you structure the log? Um, so a lot of that, like when the whole cluster fails itself. Yeah. Um, if there's there's always to find message according to the ML. When that fails, do you is there what do you keep it or store it somewhere? Um no, wrong way. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. So when the when the admission process fails, um yeah, that message usually gets returned to whatever tried to trim the workload. So like if you tried to pull something just using quick control. You would get that message right back in the console. If you had like a, a pipeline pushing your job, you would get that back in the pipeline and the pipeline would fail. There's no protection for safety. No. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much.